if you don't love reading, that's okay. We still like you. I release you from this cage. Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name's Lena and it's 20, it's 2022. How, who, who let, who let it happen? First video back, I hope you had a really nice break and we're gonna be talking about reading goals today and also doing a wrap up of my reading in 2021 and how that went. Throughout 2021, I was doing seasonal wrap up. So this is gonna be a wrap up of the last quarter, Q4, if you will, you won't, fair enough. My overall stats and I'm also gonna highlight some books that was a bit naughty and I did my 20 21 best books before the end of the year. So I'm going to highlight some books that might have made my best books of the year had I waited, but I was excited and I make no apology for that. Another thing I don't make any apologies for is the absolute Anne Boleyn core going on today. I'm enjoying it. I still feel festive. I guess not that Anne Boleyn's story was particularly festive, but I've got my Christmas lights up. I'm staying in velvet until the world looks a bit brighter. That's just how I'm rolling. I hope you will too. Without further ado, let's first talk about reading goals. We'll talk about this in the second half of the video, but uh, this year I kind of failed some of my reading goals. I definitely didn't get round to loads of the books I was intending to read in 2021. And I also fell short of some of my numerical goals. But uh, to, to be fair, in the grand scheme of things, I still had a really great reading year. And this comes off the back of somebody who uh, struggled to hit any kind of reading goal for a really, really long time. And I think basically also because of the pancetta. <laughs> My attitude to goals, and I know a lot of people's attitude to goals has changed. So I just wanted to talk about that because I think when people hear that I've read a hundred books in a year, which is what I did last year and the year before, um, they're kind of like, how did you do it? I could never do that. And I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding as to like what a good reading goal is and, and what it what it's for what it's for. I think it's good to remember that essentially a reading goal is supposed to be a fun thing. Like nobody reads for your job unless it is actually a job and you work in publishing. And that counting how many things you consume is a really weird way to measure how much you enjoy a hobby. When people play football, because I hear people still do that, uh, they don't count how many matches they were in or how many new football boots they got. The team might do that, but as an individual, what you're kind of measuring is whether you got better at something. If you're managing a garden, you don't count how many times you put your wellies on and got out there. You look at how much enjoyment you got, what your garden looks like at the end, whether you're proud of yourself, how many potatoes you grew. And I guess in this analogy, reading books, like the potatoes is the wisdom. Like it's not how many pages you turned or how many bits of soil you flipped over. It's like, what came out of that for you? What grew in you? What did, what new things did you learn? What soil did you turn over in yourself? And I think that's something that's hard to put a number against, but also way more important than how many books you read. But should you have set or are thinking of setting yourself a reading goal in 2022, I came up with five things that I think might be stopping you or may predict that you will fail your reading goals this year and why that's totally fine. So the difference between a stretch goal and a managed goal. A stretch goal I'd call something where we're always looking at exponential growth. Like every year you have to get better, every year you have to do more. And I have to say, I don't want to use the C word this early into 2022, but that capitalist mindset set of thinking that there is an endless amount of growth within yourself, like you have to keep bettering yourself and pushing yourself, doesn't apply to every situation or every hobby, for goodness sake. I think I've completely maxed out on how many books it's possible for me to read a year. And so to keep pushing myself would be silly and take the enjoyment out of it. Instead, I'd probably want to move towards a managed goal. So if you saw my video about some of my TBR things, I wanted to change the way I read. So I was reading in a more holistic way, I guess, and making sure that the books that I was reading linked together so I could get a better picture of a topic uh, by choosing books that are all in, all in one theme or category, rather than just reading one book from one person's perspective and then like running off to something else. Maybe you want your reading time to be more relaxed. Maybe you want to read more outdoors. Maybe you want to read more physical books. Maybe you want to read more audio books. Maybe you want to pay less for your books and join the library. These are all possible reading goals. And just because they're not listed on Goodreads or the Storygraph or anywhere else doesn't mean they can't be goals 
for you. The second one is your brain needs to practice. Like when people were kind of like, why, how do you read so much? How do you read so fast? Like in my defense, I don't have that many skills and reading is one of the skills I actually like trained for. It's not because I'm particularly intelligent or I have a particularly fast mind naturally. It's that like my degree was literally reading. I spent four years of my life up until my master's, like my kind of my job during the day was to read. Like I had to read and then study and then write. And that was my job. I had to consume literature. And then I moved into the publishing industry where lol, one of the big downfalls of publishing turns out you're not paid to read. You have to do all the reading in your spare time, which we'll get onto another time. But I, I essentially like reading was an essential part of my job. I had to read a certain amount of books a week if I was gonna work on them or interview the author. And it was just, part of my life. Like it was something that I had to practice all of the time. And the reason that I'm fast at reading isn't because I'm a super brain. Pinky and the brain, pinky and the brain. One is a genius, the other's insane. Definitely pinky in this situation, but I've just been doing it a long time. There's so many things I can't do. I can barely touch my toes. I can't drive a car, but yes, I can read a hundred books a year. And everybody has a different skill. And I think being disheartened by seeing somebody else's reading rate is just all of a silliness, all of a silliness. Uh, number three, you set your goals too high. I guess I just kind of covered that one. Feeling like having to set your reading goal at a round number, like 50 or 20 or 100 is satisfying. But if you're looking to double what you read last year, that might not add up to like a satisfying round number and it doesn't sound as impressive. But say you only read six books last year, your goal could be to read 12 books this year, like make it realistic. Maybe you just wanna read 30% more, calculate what that was from last year and do that. Because even a business who was working on a capitalist system, like doubling profits every year isn't what they do. They kind of like look at what they made, divide it by a certain amount and say, right, we want 20% growth on profit, what does that make? Use more complex maths to work out what your reading goal is and don't just go for like something that feels really satisfying like the number 100. The next one is you haven't found your reading style. I genuinely really struggle to sit down and read for long periods of time. I have to move around, I have to go and do something. I'm not somebody who can just sit statically and read. And I'm also somebody that reads better in certain situations. For instance, I need ambient noise or complete quiet. I can't be in a room with somebody who's doing something audible, like or, or watching TV or something. I struggle sometimes to read nonfiction and that's when I switch to audiobooks for a lot of my nonfiction, especially memoir. I feel like I get more information out of it, like contrary to some people's belief that like reading audiobooks isn't reading, like come on. <laughs> I'm able to absorb things more and I don't get bogged down in like usually the shit of the font or the heaviness of the book. Another thing that makes me read faster is that I often read in ebook, um, especially if it's a longer book, um, because I'm used to the font that I use. So sometimes when you pick up like a physical book, you you have to switch between fonts, switch between formats, and that is genuinely a bit of a, an agility ride for your brain. So using ebooks and getting used to one font and one font size like speeds up your reading incredibly, and you get that dopamine hit of having to like click the screen all the time. Like I genuinely think there's like a social media overlap part of my brain there that is like, oh, another page. So if you're struggling to hit your reading goals, um, think about switching up the way you read and the format you read in and the environment you read in. And if you expect yourself to sit still for long periods of time when that's never really been you. And number five, you're performing reading, not enjoying it. I sometimes feel like there are people who don't actually really enjoy reading, especially maybe sometimes when they review a book badly that I'm like, you just seem too angry about that being bad. Like, even if I read a bad book, the activity of reading is still one of my favorite activities and I never have like that bad a time because I still like the genre activity of reading. And I think sometimes people feel like it's this albatross around this neck, their neck, this thing they have to do. And sometimes admitting to yourself that maybe reading isn't like your main thing that you love or you haven't found your genre yet and you're forcing yourself to read a genre that is more popular and you feel like other people are reading it, but it's not really like what what makes you turn pages. I think sharing your reading and the uh, like social media aspects of online reading sometimes can encourage that, but it's really what you know within yourself to be true. And I think sometimes the performance of owning books and reading sometimes doesn't come from a place of like actual glee. And it's important to check, only you can know that, but check in with yourself and, and just be like, is reading a thing that I genuinely love? Or maybe this year I try and find a hobby that I equally love or like a little bit 
more. Maybe I want to get really geeky on podcasts or learn coding or learn to ride a unicycle. Like I think some hobbies are held up as more intellectual and more impressive than others. And I'm aware that reading is one of those things, but we don't love that kind of class bias. And if you if you don't love reading, that's okay. We still like you. Go and watch a film. I release you. <laughs> from this cage. Okay, let's talk about my reading in 2021. In total, at the end of 2021, it turns out I read 105 books. Very exciting. My goal was to read 100, so I feel happy about that. Although, you know, in my heart, I know some of them were pamphlets, some of them were itsy bitsy teeny weeny poetry collections, but they all count. They're all equal in the in the eyes of this stat gathering at least. But what I was like interested in this year was measuring page goals. So I had a 30,000 page goal wish. Uh, I thought I was really behind on that. And then I realized that Storygraph actually doesn't usually count like your page count if you have audiobooks. And I had a high percentage of audiobooks in my thing. So then I had to go through the Storygraph and delete all of my audiobooks off the record and then re-add them with the correct dates as physical books to work out. It was, it was a whole thing. <laughs> I hope they fix it. But anyway, what I deem to be my correct page goal count uh, came to 28,500 pages. Now I think this is still impressive. And what's more interesting about it, even though I didn't hit my goal, is that that's a lot of pages. And sometimes I avoid reading 500 page books or even like I, I would never, in my head, I would never dream of picking up a book that was a thousand pages long. But if I am reading 28,000 pages, <laughs> a year, I could probably fit that in. That wouldn't be devastating. And I'm actually thinking next year of just setting a page goal and not counting how many books I'm reading because I would like to read longer books. And I think that having the, the book count thing is putting me off doing that. Like I haven't read The Secret History. Why? Probably for that reason. My reading moods uh, on the pie chart thing remained pretty much the same. Reflective was my biggest category followed by emotional. Nobody's surprised there. And I'll continue as I go on, that's fine. Pacing, I read mainly medium paced books, which again is a bit of a, like that's really hard to gauge. But if I was to self chart, like what I read, like it might be different, but as Storygraph sets this for you, I guess that sounds about right. Page numbers, I read, I'm really proud of myself. I read five books this year, over 500 pages. And compared to the previous years where I literally read none, that's probably the stat I'm most proud of. I read more fiction this year than I usually have in the past, which I'm again, kind of happy with. I enjoy fiction and I'm letting myself read it. Whereas before I used to think like, I'll have to read nonfiction, it's very important and it is but it's also okay to like skew those stats and have a bit of fun as well. I used to pride myself on like a 50-50 split, throwing ambition away in a, in a handbasket to hell because uh, I do no longer care. <laughs> Mainly my genres were contemporary, literary and poetry with a little bit of young adult and historical and LGBTQIA+. Again, no surprises there. This is my real pie chart for my format breakdown because I had to ruin it to get my page stats, but this is what I really read with audiobook versus ebook versus physical. And then here is my books versus pages graph at the end. Not really much to learn here apart from I had a bit of a dip in May and June because I was really busy. But overall that all that looks about right to me. Nothing to really take from that I don't think. But now very quickly the four books that I wanted to mention to you. Uh, these first two could have been in my best books of the year but I finished them after I'd made that video. So I, I just wanted to give them an honourable mention. This one is called Breaking Into Song. Why you shouldn't hate musicals. And I wanted to read this book because I actually had a video planned for last year called why you shouldn't hate musicals. And then I realized somebody was about to publish a book with that subtitle. So I was like, I think I'm gonna wait to read the book. Uh, kindly, they sent this to me as an advanced proof. And I think I wanna read more, am I saying this aloud? I think I wanna read more theater theory in 2022, because I enjoyed this far too much. And since Sondheim died, I've been thinking more about like the mechanics of musicals and how they work. Um, so this was like a really accessible look into that and a reminder of kind of like how they work and what's special about them. And it makes some really incredible arguments about why the musicals that are on offer to us right now are so homogenous and that's my, maybe why people don't warm to them. But also this like idea of like musicals being like a, a working class endeavor and opera as being a upper class endeavor and like the cheapness or the cheesiness or the sincerity of musicals being embarrassing to at least the British persuasion. And also just like this weird thing where people say like, they don't like musicals because musicals is just music and 
story and they're two things that people never say they don't like. You don't meet anyone who's like, I just don't really like music. <laughs> like they tell you what genres they didn't like, but they wouldn't. And treating musical theatre like a genre rather than what it is like a discipline is just a weird life choice. Anyway, as you can see, it's something that interests me. If you would like me to still make that video, um, why you shouldn't hate musicals, let me know because I still have some of the script and now I've read more about it. I could probably work some learnings into it there, just if you're interested. And then this one, it's so famous, I won't talk about it too much, but The Five People You Meet in Heaven is um, a book that I liberated from my brother's room in one of my Vlogmas videos that I'll link up here. And it's just wonderful. It's as wonderful as um, people said it was. It was a classic, like, you know, people were talking about it like 10 years ago and I just didn't get on it. And it broke my heart. It's so simple, it's so heartwarming. And I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but yes, confirmed, this is a very, very good book. Two honorable mentions that probably wouldn't have made it into my top 10, but I don't think you should miss. And it feels wrong to like leave my 2021 reading behind without commenting on them. One is God is Not a White Man, which is a non-fiction book by a woman I saw speak at Greenbelt and she was like really incredible and everything she had to say, I was like, oh. Um, so I ended up coming home and listening to her audiobook. It's kind of a part memoir, part history of the church from loads of different angles. She is a Christian and she's grown up as a Christian, but she inspects her relationship to Christianity in light of being a black woman who is now learning a lot more of the religious history around racism. And because she's married to a white man, she also talks about this idea of like integration versus individuality. And I thought like, instead of trying to explain to you what is in the book, I just read out the chapter headings because I think that kind of shows the kind of in-depth flavor of the like the wide reaching things that it covers. So chapter one, God is not a white man. Two, love is not colorblind. Three, Africa is not a continent. Four, the sisterhood is black and white, Beyonce bodies and betrayal. Five, education is the path to liberation. Six, black death is a plague on all of our houses. And seven, the kingdom of God is a mosaic. I think you would really enjoy this if you are a Christian or you're religious in any way, but I also think you'd really enjoy it uh, if you're not, uh, because so much of literature and society is is I would say unfortunately built on Christianity and I think understanding the different ways that people can frame it <laughs> incorrectly is like so important and just this book I just think there, there isn't really a book that exists in this space at least that is as well written and amazing as this one so just check it out check it out and then also one I borrowed from my library in audiobook was Letters to the Lady Upstairs by Marcel Proust who is a man that I know is very famous and I have never read any of his work sorry. But I was intrigued by this because it sounded like a really cosy little memoir. It's basically a collection of letters that he wrote to the woman he lived above him in the flat upstairs while he was very, very chronically ill and mainly staying inside. So it starts, they don't have her side of the letters, but they only have his side of the letters. And it starts as, as like him just pleading with her to like, like keep things quiet between these hours because he's trying to sleep so that he can write his best work. But it also just becomes like a really lovely distance connection um, between two people in an era of time where I think we um, only hear formalities and don't often hear like the the really like silly day-to-day -day nature of being a human. So I think it was it was wasn't my favorite like obviously it's not really like constructed to have like an amazing plot or like a, a system to it or pacing. It is obviously just a collection of his letters that he wasn't planning for anybody to read but there were some really wonderful quotes in it so I think if especially if you are still stuck indoors or you are suffering from a chronic illness or you just feel like you're just stuck in life. This is like a really comforting read to hear about somebody who was so prolific in what he achieved, but also like very much not happy with being so indoors. But um, this is a quote that I wrote down from it because I really liked it. He's talking about like her write, writing him letters about what she's doing and telling him about the world outside. And he says, my solitude has become even more profound and I know nothing of the sun, but what your letters tell me. It has thus been a blessed messenger and contrary to the proverb, this single swallow has made for me an entire spring. The single swallow has made for me an entire spring. Are you kidding, Marcel? <laughs> Anyway, I've never heard people talk about that book. I just kind of randomly found it on the library app and was like, I'm gonna try it. So I just wanted to tell you it existed because I think it's very sweet. And I also really like memoir. Memoir, memoir. On that note, fellow readers and country people, uh, I'm going to go <laughs> because clearly I'm out of practice at this thing and I've rambled for way too long. As a reminder to ref a refresher for 2022, I upload 
every single Friday at 12 and I upload every other Monday at 12. So if you want to join the premiere and do the live chat, be there at UK noon. If not, it will just be there on the day for you every Friday, every other Monday. Get it in your skull. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you want some more book videos, you can catch them here. This video and all videos are made possible by the Gumption Club, who tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening. I will leave links to everything I've talked about in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Frog Snog out.